Before we get started with this video, I do just want to say that with what all is being covered here that um, we're going to be here a while, so if at any point you want to jump around or if you need to come back later where you left off, um, here are all the timestamps for this video, and <laughs> hopefully that helps with just moving around in here. Um, so you got the timestamps, so you got them, right? Got the timestamps? Good. Let's get started. Hey everybody, it's Brandon and welcome to my 2021 music gear collection video. Uh, this was something that I started as a result of me every year since about 2017 or so. I have continuously posted what my pedal boards look like, what I use, and so this video just kind of came out of that. I did one of these last year at the start of 2020. And honestly, I don't think I could have imagined within the last year how much my gear collection would have actually grown and actually still has just a hair bit more room, maybe to even grow more. Um, who knows what that means and what the future holds, but with what I'm going to cover today, I'm really excited to do this um, with all the things that I use on a regular basis to some extent, um, even if it's live, even if it's just home recording or even both. I had to make a list just to make sure I could, you know, kind of concisely do all this of what I'm going to cover in this video. Um, basically, with whatever I'm showcasing at any particular moment, I'm just going to say first what it is, um, how I got it, any uh, interesting stories or facts related to that instrument per my experience. And then uh, also over somewhere over here, I'm going to list out whatever tunings I'm uh, currently using that instrument for, whether that be anything that I am uh, manually tuning to or pitch shifting to. Um, so that's all going to be there as well. And so to get started with my whole collection, I am going to start, of course, first with bass guitars. This is the instrument that I mainly play and where I've, you know, obviously uh, poured my blood, sweat, tears, and earned my money from. So that's where I'm going to start with the showcase as I did last year. And of course, to get started, I have my first of many Yamaha basses. I am a huge Yamaha bass fanatic. Uh, to to an extent that all my basses except for one are all Yamahas, so I'm very picky when it comes to bass guitars and These guys do it. Yamaha does it for me every single time. Okay. Anyway, so to get started This is the first I have two of these. This is my first Yamaha BBG 4S2 um, A lot of the <laughs> bass names and model names have alphabet soup type names. So that's that um, Kind of what you could just chalk this up to is all reliable um, I, this was actually the first Yamaha bass I got. Um, I basically got this as a graduation present to myself when I graduated college, uh, undergrad specifically. Um, I literally just walked into the guitar center that was right by my university, saw this on the rack, uh, it was only used, and it was in great shape for the price point. And I was like, well, this is cool, I like it, so I'll take it. Um, I got it, and little did I know, this would be the one that sparked off my absolute love for Yamaha basses, and I've, you know, held on to this ever since. I've used it on numerous occasions, playing metal, um, country music. Um, I've used this with my Russian group Yansheva. Um, don't think I would ever, ever part with this at any point. Um, it is probably due for some new strings, though, so um, there's that. Um, I can't think of too many notable stories with this instrument just because it's been to so many like live shows and such um i yeah i just this is this is the genesis of yamaha for me and so yeah i'm i'm holding on to this for dear life as long as i can all right coming in next this is the second i just kind of started pulling these off the rack in whatever order um i had them in but this is the second yamaha bbg 4s2 bass that i own um this one is it's not a white finish. I know it might look like that on camera, but it is not a white finish. It's kind of like a sparkly cream finish. Uh, this is kind of the base that I've kind of said screw it and I'm throwing decals on it just for shits and giggles. This particular base was just one of uh, several eBay buys that I just happened to stumble across and um, I was already thinking about getting a base at the time that I got this, so I did uh, manage to snag it pretty easily. Um, one thing I am worried about, I just can't tell at the moment. I'm not sure if the preamp on this is totally not great or not. That's a totally different story, but should be a problem to easily replace one of those if I just go rip it open one day and look at the electronics. Nonetheless, um, <laughs> this particular bass, it is probably one of few instruments that I've gotten for a specifically designated purpose. Um, and that also extends from the tuning, uh, tunings that this is used in. This particular bass is tuned to C standard, although I have tinkered with it with dropping it down to drop B flat. 
And basically the principal reason why this base uh, sits with me is because um, anyone who knows me, I'm a huge fan of Royal Blood. Royal Blood is absolutely amazing. And um, Mike Kerr, of course, their bassist wonder dude, who <laughs> um, not only just, you know, he's just playing the bass, but he's got all these effects going to produce a guitar sound in unison with the bass sound. Another interesting thing I would bring up with this, um, just with how I got this into C standard, um, instead of taking, you know, like a typical string gauge package and dropping it down, um, what I've actually done is I have a super slinky set here uh, for any ball strings. This is a five string set. And basically what I've done is I've put the bottom four strings on this bass. So the 125 low string, which is, you know, typically on a five string bass, that'd be a low B. Um, basically I've taken the bottom four strings and tuned them up uh, a half step. Yep. <laughs> Tune them up a half step, and so that's how I've gotten into C standard, and then of course drop the low string to drop B flat. So yeah, hopefully at some point I can use this for some live Royal Blood tribute kind of stuff. Um, definitely, definitely wanted to get the sound for that figured out so I can keep on going. Um, so yeah, there's that. Coming in next for basses, this is my Yamaha RBX374. I only own one of these, and it's in this really cool jet black finish. Um, one of the things that I did from last year's video to this one is I updated the hardware just a hair So now I've got all black control knobs and all black um, Tuning machines and then I've also got a hip shot extender up here um, A couple other of my bases have hip shot extenders. Uh, this is what I use for more kind of D standard drop C stuff. So um, Drop C there's a lot there. I actually don't play a lot of stuff right now in D standard yet um, We'll see if that changes at any point, but um, I have this bass ready to go for both tunings either way. This particular bass has had some time to see some live use. Um, not as much as I probably would like it to be um, since it's a great bass for metal music and how I have it set that way. Um, definitely want to get back to doing more of that. Of course, I use that plenty here for metal stuff um, with what I record for covers. But definitely, definitely want to see this bass more um, on stage at any point. All right, coming in next still for bass guitars, this is the Simi Bass, or, well, as that translates to, the Blue Bass. Um, obviously because it's blue. Um, this is a Yamaha RBX 800 AF. This is one of two fretless bases I own. The other is coming up. Um, but with this base, this base in particular, uh, at the Bas Delia my group at Yanshiva. Um, this is the base that I primarily use for that group. Um, of course, the Rusko Rock or Russian Rock group just kind of ended up being that this fit the bill for what we play the most. And um, what I wanted to continue using it for, so obviously it gets its use primarily there. Um, I've used it in some other things before. It's always great for those fretless mwah sounds, <laughs> uh, just because fretless basses are great like that. Granted, I don't know if my other fretless bass uses for strings, what, what they're called, but um, this is using a set of Ernie Ball flat wounds. Uh, my other um, basses all use Ernie Ball round wounds. Um, so the round, or the Sorry, the flats here make a lot more sense for playing fretless stuff. Um, so obviously you can get those moi sounds more easily with flats. Okay, coming in next, this is one of two of my Yamaha TRBX 305 basses. Um, this one is kind of in a, um, I like to call this the showgirl bass just because the finish it's all, it's, it's a candy apple red and it's got some, uh, I don't know if it's gonna show well on camera, but it does have some kind of glitzy glamour shine to it and sparkle. This has been, or this was kind of where the next step of my love for Yamaha basses came for, or went next rather. Um, I bought this, um, I wanted a five string bass, um, a Yamaha one obviously. Um, this is actually one of few instruments that I've actually bought new. So I got this um, and I've used it, again, variety of situations, metal, pop, um, different all sorts of places that um, I've used this and will continue to use this. Um, I love this just because it's always been reliable, always been good to use on stage, and yeah, just a, a great, great five-string bass. Okay, next I have the second of my Yamaha TRBX, <laughs> TRBX 305s. Um, this one is just in a plain white finish. Um, I have used this continuously in just B-flat standard, um, that is, E flat standard with your low OB flat because it's a five string. Um, I've found myself increasingly working with a lot of groups that um, use that tuning or, you know, they play everything typically a half step down or such. 
Um, so this has always been great to have just because I don't have to manually change my tunings all the time and throw everything off. It's just nice to have, boom, have an e or a B flat standard bass ready to go. And then I can use that um, in a variety of situations. I wanna say, despite having this listed for B flat standard, um, this is the bass that I've probably put in the most different tunings for whatever reason. I've had this tuned simply to drop A before, B standard before. I once used a really kind of odd tuning. This was the kind of the first band I ever worked with. Um, that was AD80G. I've also used this in a GCGCF situation. Um, personally, I hated that, and that was kind of my first go around with realizing that um, string gauge is important for those kind of things when you want to drop low, uh, just with what I have. <laughs> I think this is the same set. This is, or it's an Ernie Ball Power Slinky Bass 5. Basically, I had this lowest string tuned down to a G0 note. Um, I hated it because I could never tune it correctly. It would just sit there and rumble. Taught me plenty of lessons of just how to maintain an instrument. Um, so thankful we'll have this, of course. And then also in the realm of bass guitars, uh, this is my Yamaha RBX765A. I believe I got that right. Um, this is another five string bass of mine that right now I'm just kind of using it like I uh, am the red or the red TRBX 305. How I managed to get this was I literally got a text from a friend and said, hey, uh, music store like right up the road from where you work has a very cheap Yamaha bass in good condition. You wanna go grab it? And I was like, hell yeah, I do. So I called the shop, uh, but then I, I just got, I happened to be second in the queue to get a look at it. So I was like, oh shit, maybe I won't get this bass. But then I got a call from the store saying, hey, person before you didn't want it, you wanna come look at it and get it? And I was like, Ugh. So I went up there and got it and in true COVID fashion with my mask mask equipped, um, I got this bass and it's also been seeing some usage uh, lately in some of my videos. And I've been just kind of using this flip flop with the red bass uh, for home recording stuff. So yeah, kind of a good backup if things go south. Um, the chance that something comes up where I uh, haven't used it live yet and I like to try to get all my instruments to be able to use live. Um, finish here kind of looks, as I look at it on the camera, looks pretty pretty bright. I don't think it's overly bright in person, uh, but it's a pretty cool green finish. So yeah, green base, green machine. <laughs> we can call it that. Oh, look, it's a babe. No joke though, um, I can't count the number of times that I've had people come ask me about this at shows. Um, what this is, this is a, um, not not a Kala, not not that brand. It's called Hadian. I think it's just kind of a budget line of um, various instruments and such. This is a Hadian or a Hadian ukulele bass. Um, this is not like your typical ukulele. This is basically just a downscaled bass guitar um, with thicker strings, obviously to compensate. Plays like a bass, functions like a bass, and well, really kind of functions more like an upright bass without all the you know crazy additional bulk that comes with that. Um, so no having to tote around a huge ass carrying bag or case and instrument um, when I can just go plug that into an amp and you know be ready to go and you know, just have it ready to go to play a lot of more slower kind of um, sexy sexual jazz even if you want to call it that. Um, also with um, Yanshava and some Russian rock pieces as well. Um, this is where this sees its use. Okay, moving on to guitars. I don't know if you could maybe see the camera reflection here. <laughs> to start this off, um, this is my Squire John 5 Telecaster signature model. Um, this is one I got used, but man, am I ever thankful that I've gotten this guitar. <laughs> Basically, I am an immense fan of Telecasters and um, John 5, of course, of Rob Zombie and other notable fame, uses Telecasters frequently, and so um, he's got a pair of signature models, um, both in Fender and Squire lines, um, that you know come in this block or black finish with a silver or chrome, I guess, reflective pickguard, and then there's a gold one as well. Um, which they both look amazing and I'm glad to at least just have one of them. This is one of two guitars that I've actually used live. Um, that was a while ago, um, also with the Archiva, and um, instead of me playing bass for a show, I got to play guitar. Um, so that was lots of fun, and just because we play in standard, I didn't have to do any funky tuning adjustments. Um, so yeah. So for this to be my first Telecaster um, among many, I'm always thankful to have this. The story behind how I got this was, um, basically I worked an overtime shift by myself at work one day, and which was absolutely bonkers to no end, a whole different story, but 
basically throughout the day <laughs> and kind of the days preceding, I was talking to a guy in, here in Denver um, who he said, yep, I got a John 5 Telecaster I'm selling. And I was like, I want it. So basically after this long overtime shift, um, I drove down once again to my old university actually in that area, drove down there, picked up this guitar, paid for it. Um, and I have loved it ever since. Um, I actually did swap the bridge pickup out uh, for that. I used the Marzio deactivators in all of my guitars, uh, typically just in the bridge. So yeah, I am glad for my love of Telecasters and to be this, the very first Telecaster I get to own. Um, always, always thankful I have this. Oopsies. <laughs> all right, so coming up next in the world of guitars and obviously again, Telecasters, this is, it's another Squire. It is a Squire, oh, I don't have it in front of me. It's a Squire Affinity HH. <laughs> I'll correct that here if I'm wrong. Um, basically, you know, just a Telecaster, humbucker, humbucker. I love HH Tellies, just always been my thing. Um, this is kind of in a sparkly orange finish. Kind of the, the fun story of how I got this was simply it was just on sale through Musician's Friend. I was like, cool, I want a Telecaster for the tunings I use here. Um, so that you know, that happened to be the case. But the day it was delivered to me is what makes us interesting. Basically, I was just chilling at home. I got snowed out from work one day, thinking that this wasn't gonna show up the day it did. And lo and behold, a UPS driver trudging through blizzard-like conditions came and delivered this at my door that particular day. So this is kind of the bloody snow guitar. Um, so. Uh, I never got his name, but thank you to the UPS driver who ended up delivering this in those conditions and obviously wherever else you were delivering that particular day. It's obviously just more of a, a low tuned metal guitar with obvious bigger or larger string gauges to compensate for the low tunings. All right, coming in next, this is not a Fender or a Squire. Um, this is actually from, I don't know if this is necessarily like a boutique builder or not. Um, regardless, they make awesome instruments. This is a Michael Kelly CC53 um, seven string guitar. This is the only seven string I own. If you've watched any of my videos as of recent, at the time of this video, you know this was used in my <laughs> Lacuna Coil Christmas cover. And really that's the band that got me really spurned to seven string guitars, um, just because Lacuna Coil uses those often. Um, so obviously I wanted a seven string so I could play all the Lacuna Coil stuff. One of the things that I did um, just kind of as an adjustment. Right now I'm using an Ernie Ball Power Slinky 7 set on this, on this particular guitar. However, instead of the low string on there, which in that pack is I think is a 58, um, instead I've gone ahead and used a 64 um, for that low B string. Um, I've just found, even though this is actually the longest guitar that I have in terms of scale length, um, this is 26 and a half inches scale length. Um, I just found that having that 64 instead of the 58 string on the low end or on that low B, um, it's a lot tighter and as I drop this thing down to drop A as well, um, suits that a lot better. So fun with string gauges. Also there's no denying this finish is absolutely gorgeous. Um, it's only that way on the top. It doesn't carry over to the back but still the back looks great or it looks great with um, kind of that burgundy um, finish. And if we're going to cover my seven string guitar and move into other extended range guitars, you knew this was coming. <laughs> Um, this is one I use quite a bit throughout 2020. This is a eight string guitar. Um, it's by a brand, I don't, sorry, I'll whack the camera here. It's by a Chinese maker called Zhu Wei. I, again, I hope I said that right. Basically, this was just kind of floating out there on eBay and it was thankfully where I bought it from. It was located in the US, so I didn't have to wait a long time for it. I did a whole complete video of all the mods I made on this guitar because it was just kind of a fun experience to really kind of um, dive into some more semantics with guitar modding. Um, but basically I bought this and I was like, well, I obviously got to do some things to this to make it better. Um, that neck pickup there isn't great, but the bridge pickup again, a DeMarcio deactivator. Really where I immediately got my love of eight strings for is Stefan Carpenter of Deftones. Obviously dude makes really great riffs that are just so simple. And I'm, I'm much more of the slow and simple kind of song, song making and song playing structures and whatever um so you know i got this and started immediately diving into a lot of more recent deftone stuff just because it's all done on an eight string um so yeah love using that there obviously with other videos i've made um this has made the appearance in the series i do now of taking a bunch of classic songs from whatever era 
and basically converting them into drop E, <laughs> that's what I somewhat use this for, converting them into drop E eight string guitar songs, which is always loads of fun because it's fun to take those songs and throw that eight string drop E spin on them. So I'm looking forward to continuing that onward with this guitar, as well as, you know, learning more that I can apply this with. Another thing I should mention about this guitar, just cause I think it's an interesting point, is it's actually in terms of scale length, like your typical Fender, which is 25 and a half inches uh, scale length, which most eight string guitars don't even dare go that low. For some reason, I really like that 25 inch or 25 and a half inch uh, scale length for this particular instrument. Um, I don't know if that just, again, and I kind of postulated this in my um, eight string mod video that maybe just because I'm much smaller than the average American dude, that um, the this being at the 25 and a half inch scale length suits me better. Um, I don't know if that's just me or if I just need to hold a longer scale length guitar to really kind of notice that. So yeah, the, the WMD as we would call this, <laughs> eight string guitar. Okay, moving on to the acoustic guitars. This is the first acoustic guitar in my collection and also the actual very first instrument period that I ever came to own or rather, of course, was gifted to me by, or by my parents. I have owned this guitar since I was in uh, seventh grade. Um, obviously, it's at least 10 years, 10 years ago, um, but it's always been one that I've just managed to hold on to. Despite all some of the poor treatment that I have given it over, um, and sometimes it has still continued to hold up and obviously still be playable and um, where I can take this and use it. This is actually the other guitar that I've also used live to some extent. And more recently, I've taken a liking to my acoustics, or otherwise, as you'll soon see, um, I have this tuned to E flat standard, um, but basically now, take a capo, throw that on the first fret, boom, now I'm in E standard. Moving on next in the world of acoustic guitars, and as I meant to say with this one, and as I will with this one, um, both Ibanez, this particular model is actually the um, Ibanez AEG1812. This is actually a 12 string guitar. I believe this is the most recent instrument I've acquired in my collection, or most recent guitar rather. I lose track now, so whatever. <laughs> I have a 12 string guitar. This was in a video I used just recently, a Four Non Blondes cover. Uh, but with this, this actually was kind of the Black Friday steal. Um, this happened to just be marked down considerably when I found it. I think it was through American Music Supply, and I was like, yep, 12 string, let's do it. So got it. Um, immediately put new strings on it. Um, now that I have gone through the pain and labor of doing a 12 string guitar restring. Um, I wish I also got blocking tuners for this because that would have sped things up considerably. <laughs> like my uh, starter Ibanez guitar, this is also an E flat standard. I also have a capo ready to go if I want to go up to E standard on the fly. Um, but with this, kind of where also I started with acoustic guitars and E flat standard, I basically just tried to keep tuning this to E standard it did not want to stay in E standard. It kind of kept drifting back down to E flat standard and I just said, screw it, let's put it in E flat standard and uh, let's get a capo. So that's what I did. Um, the particular capo, oh, damn, I should have done this um, before I started recording. Um, the particular, cap or particular capo I used for this, um, great 12 string capo. 12 string capos can kind of be hit or miss, um, but I'll go pull it up as I start editing, um, and I'll list out what particular capo I use here. So yeah, a beautiful cascade of strings, um, 12 string guitar here. Who knows what the next project for this might be, um, or when I can use it live. I actually didn't know this when I first bought this guitar, but when I finally got it in the mail, um, I noticed it actually has your typical quarter inch out jack. Uh, there you go in the silver over there, sorry. Um, and then I have an XLR out, which I thought was interesting. Um, maybe just for those who go direct box into a venue PA, uh, but I thought that was really cool. And so maybe if ever <laughs> I get to where I, um, that actually would be a good purchase as a PA system, <laughs> wherever that may be. Okay, and rounding out the uh, guitar side of the collection, this is my 
Ovation Acoustic. Um, I don't know if this has a particular uh, model name attached to it. It is an Ovation though. Basically how I got this guitar, um, this was a gift to me from my uncle. Um, for the longest time, I did not know what I really wanted to use this for. Um, and it, I kind of struggled with it at first, um, just because my other acoustics and generally all my guitars have a more kind of rounded C-shaped neck. Uh, this more has what I could describe more as a triangular neck. I don't know how to maybe make that shape. But for the longest time, I, I kind of found it hard to play until, um, one, I did use this guitar in my Mother's Day 2020 video where I covered the Goo Goo Dolls song Iris. Did a whole long video explaining how that worked. Um, but now, now I primarily use this guitar for Dadgad. Of course, that's low to high. D-A-D, G-A-D. Um, which, Dadgad, if you have not tried Dadgad tuning, I would encourage you to do so. It is loads of fun, um, whether you're playing some really intricate stuff or just doing something simple, um, or if you're doing a lot of droning music. Dadgad is an excellent tuning. <laughs> this is what I use that for, and I found, just kind of again with how this, the back of the neck is shaped, um, this guitar has been really conducive for me to play Dadgad, ergonomically, I guess you could say. Um, so that is what I use it for. I have not posted a Dadgad video in a while. I'm definitely looking to do that. There's a lot of like endless possibilities with Dadgad. Um, of course, I play, and I've posted previously, I play some Celtic music on this. Um, I've played some classical stuff. Um, there's all, all sorts of things that, you know, you can adapt to Dadgad, and it just sounds absolutely beautiful. So there's that. Um, yeah, if you haven't tried Dadgad, be it on acoustic, maybe it might work better on acoustic, or electric, uh, even. Play Dadgad. It is so much fun. <laughs> So the next part of this video, this is going to be all the not guitars and basses that I own because uh, I got a couple other oddball instruments here. Uh, we will go ahead and start with this. This is a mandolin. Um, this is a, um, just another kind of budget line instrument. It's a K-tone mandolin. Um, basically has a pickup in it. Um, my whole deal with this is I did, or I started mandolin um, kind of as I, uh, somewhere between late high school and early undergrad. Um, I kind of tried to pick up mandolin, didn't kind of continue it, but then I later decided to pick it up, and I have enjoyed it ever since. This also got used in the um, the Iris cover that I did, the Google Dolls Iris song, um, and I've kept it around. Um, I have some other plans for this. I kind of haven't given this too much attention for the time being, but I do have plans for um, using this more and maybe some other purely just mandolin videos. Um, I also have some unfinished business with this instrument that... Um, I'll eventually be getting around to, um, which will be its own video of just this mandolin. Um, so yeah, let's just not forget what I believe is the greatest mandolin riff of all time. The next instrument you've probably actually seen sitting here in the background waiting its turn. Uh, this is my ukulele. Um, never did I think I would come to own this, but there is a funny story behind that. So Musico Round Aurora, um, just a, a local shop here in town, um, basically had one of these, or two of these, this particular kind of ukulele, this kind of arch top cello violin looking piece um, made by a brand, um, I believe it's a Chinese, another Chinese maker called Amahi. I saw this ukulele and was like, oh, that's a really cool looking ukulele. So I went and got it. Um, I actually have never plucked this in before, so need to do that at some point. For ukulele, there's a joke out there that the only chords that you need to do anything with the ukulele are C, A minor, F, and you can throw G in there as well. Um, you could just play those chords in a loop and, you know, you could do any sort of song on top of that. Um, I used to rag the hell out of ukuleles just for that reason. It was like, ugh, ukuleles. You only need three chords to play it. This is not a complicated instrument. And then prior to me getting this ukulele, I realized I was being a very big hypocrite. I did a cover of a Zac Brown song where I kind of threw my mandolin in the mix of that. Um, should be running over here. Um, and I realized in that cover I did with the mandolin, I was only using three chords the entire time. 
And I'm sitting over here thinking, oh, the, man the mandolin is a superior instrument. And no, you you know, I, I, I can't rag this for using three chords if I go do the same thing on another instrument with just three chords the entire time. So that's what spurred me to get this. Um, of course, when I actually got this and did the whole C, A minor, F progression and G as well, um, I realized actually this is quite, quite a bit of fun. Not anything that I've come up with yet to do on a video for this. Um, so hopefully at some point, um, sooner than later, I'll come up with something uh, to do on this ukulele. Um, I got a couple songbooks and things as well just for um, some tunes I could learn and then when I get ready to record this I'll go ahead and do that and upload that. And then also looking through some of the chord progressions that we regularly use in uh, Yashava. Uh, this actually fits in quite a few of the songs there so um, maybe at some point I can use this in there as well just as a as a fun sideshow piece. So ukuleles are not bad. They're very cute and Get yourself a good one like this. So coming up next in the realm of other instruments, um, this is probably what I would call just the most unusual one. Um, all this is is just a little Newmark uh, DJ controller. I so I, I meant to include this last year, and I just kind of forgot, and I almost forgot for this video, but I felt it'd be important because um, through a lot of weird experiences, I still have this on hand and still find use for it from time to time. Basically, I just kind of got started with this whole DJ track of my student council group in high school ordered a DJ set. I was a part of the group at the time. No one knew how to set it up. I knew, so that kind of just fell to me. Um, and then through over time, I acquired my own DJ gear and here I am still holding on to or well, yeah, holding on to this controller uh, sometime later. The whole DJ side of what I've done musically, obviously not not my strong suit, um, but it's still something that I can find some great fun in. It's also represented a period of some pretty significant highs and some pretty deep lows, um, yet I still figure, figure out ways to have this around. Um, I've got a whole pool of music on a flash drive that I use on a regular basis, uh, or well, when I want to DJ this. <laughs> I can just throw it in my computer and then plug this into the computer as well, and whatever speaker's there, we get plugged into that. Obviously with COVID being a thing, this just hasn't had a lot of opportunities for use as of recent, although I've found ways to do that at work. Um, and I'm probably due for another round of going through some other music I have and updating my DJ pool uh, of music. and. Maybe we'll see this in some extended capacity. I don't know. Again, it's always been a weird part of me musically that has been there, again, since high school. Um, and for fate having it, it's still part of what I do. This is a fun little gadget to work with, and it's also really compact, so I can get it around really easy. But yeah, a little new mark party mix controller. I still hold under that. And then lastly, to round out the uh, other instruments kind of category, um, Obviously, this has kind of started popping up in some of the videos I've been doing. Uh, this is the Impact L61 Plus keyboard from a maker called Nectar. Um, basically, I am just using this right now to learn piano. Um, that's something I took an interest in and have gotten started with. Um, I use a program called Melodics. I'm not paid by them to say this, but I would encourage you to check them out if you're interested in learning piano. Um, I've personally found Melodics to be a great learning tool. and um, for using this controller where I can just go, whoop, computer over here, keyboard. Um, I've loved using it that way. And then also with this, obviously I'm not the greatest keyboardist in the world by any stretch, um, but with all I do for recording and such, not only is am I using this kind of for piano, um, I've got some other like synth VSTs and plugins that I'm, you know, kind of thinking around with right now, and it's still well fun, and I'm just kind of moving along with that. I've taken a liking to, and I would encourage this for anyone who's doing piano or trying to learn it, um, get yourself a stress ball because I'm using that to kind of build strength in my hands before I come in and do a lesson on piano every day. Um, so yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't realize how kind of weak my right hand was for playing piano. I'm, I'm used to, you know, the picking motion for guitar on this, and I was just kind of like, well, shit. I'm, I'm struggling to do right hand piano stuff, so using the stress ball and then using melodics again as my learning program. That's kind of my approach to learning piano right now, and um, hopefully I can continue to use this and use it more in expanded roles in uh, some of my cover videos, so yeah. And plus this is loads of fun and it integrates well into dolls, so fun keyboard, yeah. 
So the next part of this is really just going to be about the work in progress kind of things I've gotten into. Um, ever since I've kind of got into modding my Telecasters um, and, you know, just kind of arranging and playing with string gauges and such, I have just taken a liking to entire guitar building projects. And that's, again, what these are going to be. Um, so right now they're not in... <laughs> they're not assembled, um, but I can at least give some insight on uh, what I am working on. And of course, if we're going to talk about a work in progress project, uh, we are going to talk about the Bumble Caster. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the body with me right now. I am at the mercy of Colorado weather to um, warm up, and so I can actually go finish clear coating the body. Um, I have that painted, and I'll show that over here. Basically, um, this is a top to bottom refit project. Um, where I took a starter guitar that was gifted to me by a co or former coworker of mine in one of the schools I worked in. Um, I basically gutted it, took it all apart, and am installing a whole new set of hardware and did a bunch of paint on it as well. This is actually not the original neck. Um, this is one I bought specifically for the guitar. Um, then I'm painting it yellow, obviously, to match that bumblebee bumblebee aesthetic. So yeah, unfortunately not at the point yet um, until things warm up that I can fully put this together and see that creation realized. I actually did get all the wiring work for the electronics done just recently, so all I will really need to do once I have the body back is I am going to, um, you know, obviously get everything screwed together, um, get the, and I've already tested this and hopefully it does work because I really won't know for sure until I put it all together, um, get the uh, output jack wired up correctly and hopefully I will have a dream build realized. Um, really thrilled that I can make this in a bumblebee kind of thing, <laughs> or a, you know, again, a bumblebee aesthetic or look. Um, but I, I'm just thrilled for how this is going to turn out in the end. And the first video that I have in mind for this, um, I'm really excited to do that as well. So yeah, the bumble caster. Hopefully coming soon. And wouldn't you know it, although this may be a little too ambitious, even <laughs> to start now, even if I don't have the bumble caster finished. Um, I do have another build project I'm working on and I'm also very excited for to uh, get working on that. Um, I obviously, right now, I'm just kind of collecting the parts for it. I know exactly how I'm going to assemble this, um, but I, and I don't have the body. I'm waiting for the body to continue to ship here. Do have the neck. So that's something, right? Um, but once I can start getting this work done, this next build project, um, I am definitely gonna post updates like I have been for the Bumblecaster. That, or this project's not going to be a top to bottom refit like the, the uh, Bumblecaster is. Um, basically, this is just kind of building from the ground up, um, a parts caster, if you will. Um, you know, basically, I'm just gonna assemble a, a combination of parts. Um, and you know put a guitar together out of that i've learned my lesson to not try to attempt these things when it's cold weather um, at least when it comes to painting but i will at least get a decent start on what this is going to end up being and um, equally as excited for that so hopefully i get the body soon um, after i film this video and i can showcase that a little more another piece of this i wanted to include was pedals and effects um, I have gotten questions on that from time to time, so I figured this would be a good place to round it out here. And again, this is where this tradition of doing um, gear videos has come from, is from my pedal boards over the years. So I'll just kind of start here with two that are on, always on standby. Just This is an MXR AB box, and then I just have this Digitech Whammy. All right, this is where one of two things I'm really proud of. This is my uh, base pedal board. Um, I did post something on my socials just a couple days ago. Man, this is heavy. I did just post something about um, kind of how it's, you know, again, my pedal boards have evolved over the years. Uh, but, you know, kind of basically what I'm doing here, tuner, obvious reasons, tuner pedals are great. Um, or a Boss LMB3, limiter enhancer, uh, just kind of bringing out the highs and mids a little bit. Uh, Dunlop Mini Crybaby Wah, fun pedal. Um, another one I love is this dark glass pedal. So I can't look at the model name. I don't want to flip this around. Um, but if you're a bass player and you have not heard of dark glass yet i'm sure you might have um dark glass pedals are amazing <laughs> i love that as well so there's that um then oh which way does this go again oh we go over here uh just another um uh, quick eq pedal um and then going into noise suppressor or noise gate um and then i end the chain um critique my chain as you will um, but i end my chain after the noise gate um, with a Digitech Chorus pedal, and then another really fun pedal. Um, I haven't found too much use yet at the moment, but I'm still keeping it on hand. A TC Electronic Flashback Delay. Um, really fun pedal with a lot of features on it, so uh, if you're ever needing a delay pedal, 
there's that for you. And then lastly, in the world of pedals and effects, um, this is perhaps one of the single greatest things I have ever gotten for myself as a musician. Um, this is a Headrush pedal board. Um, Headrush is a company, they kind of make some other kind of different boards. They have the gig board and I believe the looper board as well. Uh, this is their pedal board variant. I, I cannot stress enough how, how customizable this is. Um, this is kind of in the same vein as what you'd see from the Line 6 Helix or uh, even some Axe Effects. Um, I, I don't have it plugged in here and I would show you, uh, but you can, re you can go watch countless videos on this. Um, that little screen there in the middle is a touch screen and basically the whole UI of how this works is so amazing. <laughs> this is all honest from the hard stuff. It's pretty, for someone like me who still doesn't really know a lot about guitar tones, it's pretty idiot proof. <laughs> um, so. It, it really gives you a whole lot of free reign and templates to construct your guitar tones. And um, with all the things that I've done guitar-wise, uh, especially through 2020, this has been the driving force of my tones and such. I have my own metal setup, my own cleans, my own kind of classic rock setup. I have an acoustic setup. Um, I'm even gonna get one set up for the ukulele and the mandolin. There's a lot you can do with this. And again, if you're a musician, um, and you, you know, do have the means to get this, I would absolutely recommend getting a headrush board. This was recommended to me by someone who, um, who has one as well. Um, and I would in turn recommend it to anyone else who happens to stumble across this video and um, you're playing any instrument really. Um, as much as I like using my analog board or more analog board for bass, this can fit so many different kind of situations. And so, yes, these things are amazing. And that's gonna do it. That is my 2021 music gear collection. Uh, really hope you enjoyed this video. I'm <laughs> looking at my deep dive of all the stuff I own and like to use um, in all sorts of different settings. Probably gonna be interesting to see where uh, my gear collection looks now compared to when I do this in the or in the subsequent year. Nonetheless, if you have any questions or comments about any of the gear I use, um, I am very receptive to feedback and comments and all that all that stuff and. Um, just talking about gear in general. If you do have anything you want to throw at me, um, feel free to do so in the comments of wherever you're watching this, and I will look to answer you as soon as I can. But otherwise, and of course with the circumstances that be, I hope you and your loved ones are staying safe as always. Um, hopefully, again, we get to see the end of this sooner than later, and us, for all in the, mu or in the musician world, we can go back and really get on stage to full crowds um, again soon. Um, I think we're all looking forward to that. But again, thanks for watching and I will see you in whatever my next video might be.